we all dreaming of a tech-free <laughs> deployment workflow. Um, so my name's Tanya, I, I work at Seek as an Apple system administrator. Um, so today I'm talking about the tech-free deployment workflow. What that means is um, just being able to get a Mac fresh out of the box, uh, completely unmanaged, and then put it up, turn it on, plug it in, turn it on, and through the magic of DEP and MDM, have it be um, managed and have all the software and settings that your organization requires without there needing to be a deployment tech there to start the process off or to intervene at any point whatsoever. Um, the benefits of a tech-free deployment workflow are that your end user gets that wonderful unpacking experience um, that that a lot of, uh, I'm sure a lot of marketing engineers at Apple spent many, many hours designing. Uh, also a faster rollout. So obviously if you're not depending on a deployment tech to be there to set the Mac up, then the, 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 the process of getting the Mac from the hardware vendor to the end user is streamlined, it's faster. Um, uh, in a lot of organizations, you're gonna have periods of time where all your level one and level two techs are incredibly busy. Um, and also you might have an influx of new Macs to set up. Uh, if you don't need the deployment techs to be there, then you don't need to worry about those, those moments um, where deployments are gonna be delayed. And also, if you're not dependent on a deployment tech to be there uh, during, that, during that workflow, it also means that you can um, uh, easily set up a Mac for someone uh, that is off-site, working from home, maybe um, set working from a satellite office that doesn't have a full-time um, support person. So I think that when, when evaluating whether a, a tech-free deployment workflow is, is right for you, the number one thing to think about is your customers, your end users. Um, and I think that most of us would, would agree that there's no... Uh, I get the, the end users are varied. There's diversity in their needs, in their expectations, um, in their demands. So as, thinking, thinking of that diversity, um, I think that f for me it's quite obvious that, that there shouldn't really be one deployment workflow that's going to work for every single situation. It just doesn't make sense. You're going to have some situations where employees are on-site or off-site. You're going to have some um, uh, end users that have uh, just started at the company. Their expectations of what that workflow looks like to them is going to be different to someone who has been at the company maybe for 10 years and has a whole lot of data on their current Mac and really they, they want to make sure that their old data is transferred over to their new data. So that deployment workflow is going to look completely different. Um, and you also might have someone that's new to Max in general. They might be someone that's worked at the company for a long time, but they're um, migrating across from a Windows workstation to a Mac workstation. So the other thing to consider um, when, uh, when thinking about what your customers' expectations of a deployment workflow look like um, is to think about their technical abilities. So you're going to have some people that are very technical and incredibly happy that they get to do the unboxing of their Mac and very happy to be able to click on that, um, you know, on the, on the, on the setup um, windows when they turn their Mac on. Um, but then you're going to have some people that get very nervous at the idea of having to enter the account name information um, and having to enter the, the, the password themselves and, and set up the account themselves. And they might even be um, uncomfortable with having to plug the, uh, an, an adapter in to, to connect it to the network. So 
I think it's really important to think about your customer expectations and the fact that not all your customers or end users are alike. Um, and also just in terms of the, the, the variety of different end users that you have in an organization, um, something else to consider is uh, someone might be incredibly technical, but also incredibly busy. And so they may be the um, lead dev of a, of a team and they're so busy that their expectation is that when they get their new Mac, they just turn it on and everything's ready for them. They don't want to be sitting around waiting for things to be installing. But if you decide after all of that to go ahead and pursue a tech-free deployment workflow, so following the yellow brick road, there are a few questions that I think that you need to consider. Um, so, so just the, the obvious ones. Um, so first of all, when will the setup workflow be initiated? So does, do you start installing the software and, um, and the configuration settings as soon as the Mac gets enrolled into MDM? Or is it something that you want your users to initiate? So maybe like a, a self-service to have a setup Mac press button here um, item. The next question is, what's the end user gonna see during that, that setup workflow. Are they going to see uh, a progress bar? Are they going to see a list of what's getting installed on their, on their Mac and how it's progressing? Um, if they are going to be given that information, is it going to be a full screen splash screen? Or is it going to be a window that's hovering in the middle that can't be moved or it can be moved? Um, or will it be uh, a menu bar item that they click on? So they click on it, and then they, got a, 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 they get a, a, a pop-up that displays how their Mac setup is progressing. Or is it something that just happens in the background as well, and you just don't let them know, and you install everything, and, 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 and then just, uh, um, and you expect that the customer doesn't really care what extra applications are being installed. So these are all things to, to consider. Once you decide what that interaction looks like, uh, the next question is what tools do you use to create that interaction? So if you do decide to have a splash screen, what's it gonna look like? So I'm just gonna briefly go over um, Splash Buddy and DEP Notify. Um, I haven't used either of them. I've used something else called Trigger. Um, so, but I think that both Splash Buddy and DP Notify are, are fantastic, incredibly well documented and, um, and very well supported. Um, so Sl uh, Splash Buddy integrates with Jamf Pro. As you can see there, you, can, you get the, the list of applications that are getting installed and, and what the status is. So it, as it progresses along, um, the user can you know, see, see what's being installed and, and possibly you can adjust, you can adjust the, that, main, um, that, that main block of text to provide maybe some onboarding information. So this is a screenshot from uh, James Smith's uh, presentation. At the end, I, I've got a link to um, some, some good sort of reference links. The next one is DEP Notify. It is uh, really easy to use and, um, and very well supported. If you go to the Slack channel, you can very quickly get some, some help on how to, how to use it. Um, so the way that it works is DP Notify sits there and looks at the contents of a log file. Um, by default, it's um, var temp DP Notify log, but you can, it can be any file that you specify. Um, and so it looks at the contents of that log file and, and then adjusts that pop-up screen accordingly. So in the seven or so echo commands that I've, I've got there, I'm telling DP Notify what icon to show, what text to, to show, and how far along in the progress bar I want. Um, I, I want it to um, show the progress. Uh, so I used, um, I've been using something called Trigger. Um, it's something I created, so I've just been using it mostly just out of ego. But the, 
The way that it works is that you tell it what HTML file to show. So, so Trigger will show a web view, um, what HTML uh, file to show, and while it's showing that HTML file, uh, what command to run. So in this case, the command is wait. Um, what, uh, what that's saying is just wait for the user to click a button in the web view. Uh, but that command can also be other things, so like um, a policy event, so a, a, a custom trigger for a, for a policy, um, or it can be a, um, a shell command, like update all the software. Um, and then you've just got what does the, how, how big the dimensions of the, of the pop-up and, and whether you want a title bar or not. So something like this um, comes up looking like that. Um, my design skills are, you know, pretty average, so that's as, as good as it gets, really. Um, but you can see the, the, that next button, the user clicks next, and then it'll jump to the next command web view pairing or, um, or just exit altogether if there's nothing, nothing there for, for trigger to, to display. <coughs> uh, the other utility I've been using is menu bar trigger works exactly the same as trigger, except that um, the web view only gets displayed when a menu bar icon gets clicked. Um, so I'm displaying that HTML file, and I, while this policy is being run, the installation of Outlook, I want that HTML file to be what the user views when they click on the icon. Um, and this is the icon that I want to show in the menu bar and the dimensions of the web view of the, of the pop-up. So this is what it ends up looking like. And that's a, over the Outlook icon. I just have an animated GIF that I think indicates to the user that something's happening, right? That it's not just frozen like it is in this screenshot. Um, so, putting it all together, my workflow is about 10 different policies that I'm running, um, uh, some configuration setup stuff, um, and then a whole bunch of different applications that I'm installing. Um, and, and this is how um, I bring it all together with menu bar trigger. Um, one thing that I added is, uh, so I've got that icon that I'm showing as the menu bar icon, um, but then I've got some additional icons that are, um, that are being set at particular, install at particular um, command points. So what I'm saying is that when policy event nomad is being run, I want the icon to be different. Um, and the reason I did this is because I really liked the idea of an end user not necessarily needing to click on the menu bar icon to get an idea of how the workflow is progressing. Um, I like the idea of the icon itself being a visual cue um, as to how far it's going along uh, or whether it's completed. So putting it all together, this is a demo. And so this is just um, a HTML. That's like that's just some CSS and HTML. Um, and as you can see, the menu bar icon is changing as it as the um, setup progresses. And then at the very end, I have just a pop up that says that's asking the user to reboot their Mac. Um, and that's just uh, the wait command, where it's sort of just sitting there waiting for them to do that. So once you decide on you know, what the look and feel is for the end user, I, I guess the, the, the actual, um, the, the meat of it all is what, what's, the, the, what's the setup? What's being installed on the Mac? What's being configured? Um, obviously, every organization is different. Um, but what I'm just going to go over now is just a couple of challenges that I've encountered um, and, how, and how I've dealt with them. So in our organization, we name Macs based on their asset tag. The asset tag is um, it's a sticker that's uh, placed on the Mac. It's got a barcode. Uh, it's... Uh, a number followed by four or five, uh, sorry, a letter followed by four or five numbers. 
and we need to name the MAC before the MAC is um, bound to AD because, the, because I'm not going to go into it. <laughs> Every organization's different. <laughs> and I think also in universities, I've found that what, what the name of the MAC is is quite important. It makes your job um, in supporting them a lot, uh, a lot easier. So oh, there's quite a, a few approaches to this, but I think that fundamentally, if you're wanting to have the MAC during its workflow, somehow magically know what its computer name should be, then what you're looking at is that Mac being able to communicate to anything, even just a CSV file hosted somewhere. All it needs to do is just say to that CSV file, this is my serial number, what name should I have based on what you've got recorded there? Um, so you can definitely set up your own API and, and your own database, um, or you can just leverage off the JSS API. Um, and so I'm just going to show you how to, how to do that. Um, and then I guess the other approach is to build your own. Um, I did actually build my own, so that's Autotron. What I'm hoping to do is make this um, open source. So I'll just talk about a little bit about how it works, and then if anyone wants to help me out um, in developing it further, I would be happy to chat. And the other approach to this, to this challenge is to prompt the end user for what their com the computer name should be. Um, so this is actually a plan B in our workflow if the first um, approach fails because the network's down, the database is broken. Um, the, the plan B is to actually prompt the user for this information. Um, so with the JSS API, you've got, you've got scripts um, that can be anything, including a CSV file. So um, I've created, a, I've created a, a, a script that just has all the serial numbers and what I think their corresponding computer name should be. And then in, my, um, in the build workflow, the Mac is doing an API call to, the, um, to grab the script content. And then it's just looping through and looking for its own serial number. And then when it finds it, it grabs the computer name and then does the renaming of the Mac at that point. Uh, with Autotron, uh, the reason that I uh, decided to do a, um, uh, create my own solution was because Seek has um, hackathons twice a year, um, which are a fantastic opportunity for all employees to just focus on something that's not BAU um, and, and, and something that's, that's challenging and, and um, and it's somehow related to, to, to their day-to-day -day job. Um, so what I did is with Autotron, it's an, it's an iPhone app. Um, you can very easily integrate a barcode scanner in an app. And so as the Mac comes in still in the box, the tech can scan the model number of the Mac, the serial number of the Mac, and then also scan the asset tag barcode or manually enter it in. So what should be the asset tag of this computer? And that uploads it to a database that I've just got sitting on an Office Mac Mini. Um, and so part of my workflow is just doing an API call to that database. I wrote it in PHP because that was the most Googleable solution that I could find. Um, but yeah, um, it's... Uh, doesn't necessarily need to be in PHP, obviously. Um, and so, th the, the, as I mentioned, the other option is to ask the end user what the name of the computer should be. Um, and so I present this using Trigger. So this is just a HTML view, um, a page that's getting displayed as, a, as, as full screen. Uh, the good thing with um, being able to present a HTML um, view is that you can put some JavaScript functions in there to do some um, data validation of, um, to make sure that they, A, enter something in there before they press continue. So if they press continue, it's, it's going to highlight. You've got to put something in there. In there. Um, but the other cool thing is that you can just um, do some, some 
check for maybe confirm that it starts with the letter and has the format that you're expecting. Um, with, yeah, just a JavaScript function. Uh, the other challenge that I encountered was um, local tech accounts and having them be file vault enabled. Thanks, Apple. Um, so we have a local tech account on all our Macs. The username is Toc. Um, and the end user also has a local admin account. Um, I think there's, uh, having the local tech account be file vault enabled is an extra, it's an, another point of entry. And so I do question whether it's a good idea to have a local tech account be file vault enabled and whether you should just rely on the um, uh, file vault redirection of the, uh, the recovery key redirection uh, if you need to get access to, uh, to, a, to someone's workstation. But for now, this is something that we um, need, to, need to enable. So the workflow that I've got working is, for now, um, is the pre-stage enrollment creates that local tech account and also the end user creates their own local tech account. We, as part of the um, uh, build workflow, I'm updating that local tech account, that TOC account, to be a unique password. Um, and then uh, um, that unique password gets uploaded to the JSS, just so that when the tech needs to get access to that local tech account on the Mac, they log into the JSS and have a look at what the barcode, um, barcode one string is. That's the password for that Mac. Um, and then what we're doing is we're giving the end user with, with their network account a staging password, which is just another way of saying it's a password that is the same. It's generic. Everyone knows it. Um, the reason we need to do that is because if you want to have both accounts be file vault enabled, you need to know what their password is. Um, and so I'm enabling file vault by uh, the FDE setup enable command and I'm, and I'm piping in the, um, that, that P list where I'm giving it the um, end user's password and the local tech um, account's password. Oops. In AD, that end user's account is set to require a password um, update at next login. And so when Nomad pops up and, gets, and, and asks them to log in, they have to change their password at that point. So we just need to make sure that File Vault is enabled before they update their password. Um, and so you put the logic in there. To enable, to, to enable that, to, to make sure of that. Um, and yeah, that's it. Other things to consider, um, as I sort of mentioned briefly with the needing to make sure that they don't log into Nomad until both accounts are enabled for FireVault, uh, you really need to think about the order in which you're going to be installing things and, uh, and configuring things. It's super important. Get that right. Um, uh, get that right, obviously, before you go ahead and, and, um, and, and trust that everything's going to work uh, without, uh, without your intervention. Um, keep the installations as small as possible. I think that if you keep the installs um, small, you reduce the chances of the user um, getting impatient with the setup or just interrupting the installation. Um, so an example of that is the fact that we used to install the Office Suite using the um, Office 365 package, so the whole thing. Took a very long time, so just broke it up into individual packages. Um, and also maybe put some logic in there to um, check if this Mac is being re-imaged. Um, what I've got is I just have it look at that barcode value, and the assumption is that if it's 
if the barcode value for that computer in the JSS has a password string, then um, it's a, a machine that's been re-imaged, and so I want to just flush all the policies at that point. Once you do that, once you've got it set up, you need to really prepare for the worst because the, the, this process isn't smooth at all. I think that the most common thing that you're going to have to deal with is DP being down or not working. Um, there's also other common things that could occur, like the Mac running out of battery um, or an installation being interrupted by the user. So when I was doing research on this, I went on the DP Slack channel and it's just, there's a lot there, a lot of emotions, a lot of, a lot of feeling. Um, so I think that the, the worst part is really that you go to find out if the DP service is down and <laughs> according to Apple, <laughs> everything's perfectly fine. Um, but then, yeah, you go on the Slack channel and quite clearly it's not. Um, so what, one approach to this is to make sure that there's an analog, <laughs> so a, a paper um, instructions for the end user. So we've got there the, the username and that staging password um, that we're asking the user to put in when they set up their account. And we also have a plan B if they don't have that splash screen that's, um, oh, sorry, I should have mentioned, they get a splash screen saying something's about to happen um, and then and, and, and check the menu bar icon to, to um, get progress of, of what's happening. Um, I'm asking them to curl <laughs> through. I, I, um, I, yeah, I didn't update this. <laughs> um, the reason I did this is because I found it. I found. <laughs> I found it a lot easier to explain than go to this website and then click here and then, um, as in the the um, user initiated enrollment. Um, link, um, and then double click on the package that you download. <laughs> and this was just a, a little bit easier, I think. It, so no, it needs work. <laughs> you have, you know, you can own your end users in all sorts of other ways. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> um, <laughs> with the Mac running out of, uh, out of battery, uh, one thing that you can do is just check to, set, to confirm that the, the power adapter is plugged in. Um, and so this is, once again, a splash screen that's presented using Trigger that's just saying, hey, detected that your power adapter isn't plugged in, plug it in, click done. Uh, the um, PM set is what I use, and that, so that I'm just looping through until it detects that it's plugged in. Um, another thing that I've been grappling with is um, interrupted in installations. Um, a way to let the user know that that really long installation of Word, um, it's, that it's still progressing and you can't use Word for now. And so I think that, um, like at the moment, the, 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 the complete workflow takes between 10 to 12 minutes. It's not very long, um, but it depends on how the network is, is going. Um, so there, there may be situations in which it's going to take double that. So I wrote up this, this um, workflow that isn't perfect um, and it's still, I guess, in progress. But then I went to a um, uh, Tony's presentation yesterday, and he talked about extension attributes in the API, and it just made me realize that I don't need to do a, a lot of what I've been doing. Um, so number one, <laughs> update um, uh, the extension attribute via API to indicate that a particular application is installing. Um, and that should drop the machine into the smart group that's um, called Microsoft Word is installing. Um, and then you run a Jamf manage before and after each install. And then what you do is you have a restricted software record um, which is scoped to that smart group, Microsoft Word is installing, um, so that if they do run the Microsoft Word process, 
they get a pop-up that at least informs them of um, what's happening and to check that menu bar app to get some more information about how the setup is progressing. Um, so hopefully that might be useful to um, so some people. Um, so in summary, I would say definitely consider your users' expectations first and foremost. Um, don't think that there's going to be one deployment workflow that's going to, that has to um, work for everyone. And a tech-free deployment workflow um, might be good for maybe only 20% of your customer base. Um, but keeping them happy um, is really our, uh, should be our priority. Or keeping them happy and also giving them an experience where they can quickly just get on with doing their job and using their Mac um, safely and effectively. Think about what information the user needs to see during that setup workflow and what that looks like. Um, uh, whether there's any user interaction where you're asking them for information, how are you going to do this? Um, I guess it's, it's a question of design and making it as pleasant as, as possible. Um, I really think that, that the third point, think about the tricky stuff, should be number one. I think that um, spend a lot of time on the, the main challenges, um, so the computer naming, the computer naming and AD binding, file vault, um, and the order in which you can be installing things. Uh, I think get that right first and then proceed to um, thinking about the, the design and interaction part. Um, and also prepare for the worst. So the worst is um, at this point probably more likely to happen these days. Um, I think things are going to get better, but for now, definitely prepare for the worst. Um, that's it. Uh, I've got, uh, please reach out to me on Slack if you need any further information about anything. I had hoped to put up a lot of the um, scripts up on, um, on, on my GitHub, but um, I just never got around to it. So just nag me and it'll put sufficient pressure on me to, to get it done. Um, these are some links and I'll, and I'll share the slides on my, um, on my blog, which I haven't updated for a year, so I'll do that too. Uh, that's it, thanks. <laughs>